Hello and welcome to this lecture. My name is Dr. Neil Zogi. Within this lecture we will be focusing upon the ancient Near East and we will be looking at the Minoan civilization. This is week two and the third part in the lectures for week two. So within the Minoan civilization this is a civilization that is a bit of a surprise. We knew of it from fables and myths, but we didn't really believe it to be true until about a hundred years ago. Now the classical Greeks wrote poems and songs about an age recorded before time. It was an age of gods and heroes. It was an age of monsters and epic wars. And several hundred years ago, we just thought that's all it was. Mere fables. Dreams of imagination. Stories told by ancient peoples that had no grounding in reality. And it took the work of a brilliant Englishman by the name of Arthur Evans to uncover the realities behind the myths. He and his team revealed the story of the Minoans. It's a dazzling culture, completely lost in time. This was the builders of the mythic labyrinth and some will even argue that it is the location of the la lost land of Atlantis. It's probably most important to go back and review how historians used to view the history of the world. Now in the late 1800s, the view was that the early Greek culture burst onto the scene to form the foundations of human, well, at least Western civilization. In all its deep cultural ideas, drawing upon the arts and literature and government. And yet this Englishman, Arthur Evans, simply asked a lived question. Is this really true? Is there something that came before the archaic Greeks? And from that point on, he spent his life pushing back the boundaries of the history of Western civilization. Now, it isn't just that Arthur Evans was born in the 1850s. It isn't just that he grows up in an era that is questioning many of the standard beliefs of the day. He also has a special context. First off, he was born into an incredibly rich English family, the son of John Evans. He would inherit millions from his father's fortune, and this would transform his ability to do something powerful with his life. And secondly, his father was a very avid archaeologist, and he taught his son, Arthur, everything he knew. So, Arthur Evans caught a passion for archaeology and caught a passion for history from his father. And he had the money and the resources to pursue the question of his life. Is there truth to these ancient stories and myths? Now, in some ways, you might envision Arthur Evans as being a boring sort, but he wasn't. He was a wild man. He traveled the world 
but he was also a dedicated student. And he became a noted scholar, being educated in Oxford. However, he didn't live in the library. He was not a bookworm. In fact, by the time he was in his 30s, he had spent time in jail in Bosnia, accused of acting as a political subversive against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He didn't just hang out at Oxford University. He wanted to go off and see the world. And then he heard of work by a historian by the name of Heinrich Schliemann. And that captured his imagination. Now, Heinrich Schliemann was an interesting fellow in his own right. He was born in 1822, lived till 1890, and he was a German businessman that really pioneered the modern field of archaeology. He was an advocate for the historicity of places based upon the works of Homer. He believed the works of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, were based on real stories. And so he went searching for different sites. And lo and behold, he found the city of Troy. He, not just that, but he found the sites of Mycenae. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that next week. But for right now, what's fascinating is that the Iliad which was a poetic song by Homer, and we'll explore that a little bit when we speak about the archaic Greeks. But it chronicles what happens with the Greek city-states as they assault the city of Troy to rescue the beautiful Helen. And the story of when the struggle seemingly ended in a stalemate until, and we all know the story, the Greeks tricked the Trojans by hiding inside a giant wooden horse. So this is the story, uh, the stories of uh, Agamemnon and the Argos and Helen and Achilles and Paris and the Trojan War. And then we have uh, Agamemnon returning from Troy and then being killed by his, uh, the lover of his wife. And, and all of this, according to Homer, was part of this story. And Schliemann showed to us that it wasn't just some fanciful story, but it was actually based upon historical events and actual cities and actual empires. Fascinating. Now, what that did was spark the imagination of Arthur Evans. So these discoveries of Schliemann captivated Arthur Evans. He was convinced that such a people, a people that could do all of this, that they had to be literate, you simply cannot have a well-developed material culture without a well-developed written language. That became part of his great work to unravel part of this mystery. For Arthur Evans, uh, the part of the story of Mycenae will have to wait for a later lecture. But for now, it does move the history of the Greeks back with Arthur Evans. So as I mentioned, the questions are what drove Arthur Evans. And so one day in Athens, Evans went to visit Schliemann. And Schliemann and Evans discussed a strange artifact that does not seem to fit in with a lot of the artifacts in Mycenae. Uh, and I believe it was a ring. But it's a ring with a symbol on it. And it's the symbol of an octopus. 
You see, the Mycenaeans, they were primarily a landlocked empire and civilization. Um, yes, they, they had ships, but it didn't seem to make sense to use the octopus as a symbol. It just didn't seem to fit with everything else that was found by the My, uh, at the Mycenaean sites. And this got Arthur Evans thinking. There must be another great civilization out there. Perhaps this ring was an artifact that Mycenae received from perhaps an even older great civilization of the Mediterranean world. But he had just this one clue and a question. And he searches year after year and then finally in 1892 he was kicking around the dirt around a Mycenaean site and found some vases that appeared to be pre-Mycenaean and he wrote to his wife about how strange it was that no one had noticed these potsherds these vases and he then visits Greek markets for sellers selling artifacts and he was looking for artifacts that have similar workmanship to the octopus ring and to these vases and it's here that he gets a huge break in the case the sellers did not collect them in the region of Mycenae but on an island on the island of Crete 350 kilometers away. And this sent Evans to Crete. And here Evans realizes that Homer's Iliad still had much to tell him. According to Homer, the island of Crete had many great cities, and the greatest of these is Knossos, where King Minos ruled in council with mighty Zeus. Now, in Greek mythology, Minos was the first king of Crete, son of Zeus and Europa. Every nine years, he made King Aegeus pick seven young boys and seven young girls to be sent to Daedalus, to, to the creation of Daedalus, a public works designer, uh, to the labyrinth is what Daedalus created. And they were sent to the labyrinth to be eaten by the Minotaur. And after his death, Minos became a judge of the dead in the underworld. So all of this were things that Arthur Evans was really fascinated with. And he went to Crete, and wouldn't you know it, he found Kenosis. So, we have the civilization now that we call the Minoan civilization of Crete. And it's named that after Arthur Evans named the Minoan civilization after King Minos, the first king of Crete in Homer's Iliad. Now, Arthur Evans now had a place to focus his attention to answer the questions that plagued him, he moves his operation to Crete and begins to learn about Minos. On Crete, he soon realizes that the locals were well familiar with the artwork of artifacts that he had seen in the marketplace. And the locals would find them on the ground and they would wear them as lucky charms. And Evans eventually identified the general area of Knossos and took many years to eventually purchase the land. Now here is where it becomes very fortunate for Evans that he has these millions of dollars. So it's a very good thing that he was a millionaire in some respects because it took six years of negotiations before he secured the land. And not only did that take a long time, but while negotiating the land, he suffered quite greatly. His wife died, and then 
a civil war broke out in Crete. So he had to go back to England until things settled down. And it was a frustrating time, waiting to pursue his passion. And then finally, in 1900, things started to come together for Arthur Evans. Evans now knew he was beyond his knowledge base. He was fascinated with archaeology, but he wasn't technically an archaeologist. And so he hired another professional archaeologist by the name of Duncan McKenzie to run a team to excavate Kenosis. Now, Duncan McKenzie was a well-noted Scottish archaeologist who had um, made a, a pronounced name for himself. He had a PhD from Vienna in classical archaeology, and he'd also done some work uh, in other areas and was highly recommended to him by Arthur Evans. And for the next 30 years, he worked with Evans until Duncan McKenzie, unfortunately, started to uh, suffer from some form of dementia and had to be let go. But by the summer of 1900, as digging was a, a few months in, it was already becoming clear that this Minoan civilization is older and greater than classical Greece and older than Mycenae. Walls of great buildings and floors and pottery that was not of a style seen before was all discovered. Mackenzie concluded that Kenosis could date back as early as 3000 BCE and that a great dynasty existed until around 1400 BCE. Then, very quickly, it seemed to decline. And it seemed like in the history of that empire, it was in an instant it was gone. So they were extremely lucky in their dig. They owned the land, so there was not restrictions for digging and excavating there. And in the first year, they actually discovered the palace and even the throne room of King Minos. Now, the artwork and the fresco of this Minoan civilization reveal a life of art, of athleticism, and also of leisure of women dressing up and relaxing in social settings, of men in daring acrobatic sports, flipping over the horns of bulls. And throughout, there is images of the bull. And this tells us that there was something to the imagery in classical Greek poet Ovid. And the story is that the Minotaur was the deformed son of Minos, body of a man, the head of a bull. And I would suggest that we consider that this son had a disease that caused uncontrolled bone growth in the face. Now, very few cases have been seen in medical literature up until the 1970s, there was only about 10 documented cases of it. And then there was a boy by the name in the United States of Rocky Dennis Mason. Uh, and if you want to learn a little bit more about him, the movie Mask is based upon this boy. And he lived until about 1978, when he died at the age of 17. And he suffered from something called craniodiaphyseal dysplasia, or CDD, also known as lionitis, because your face forms like the face of a lion or of a bull. The face, the eyes get pulled apart and the head gets elongated like a bull. And it's an extremely rare 
autosomal recessive bone disorder that causes calcium to build up on the skull, disfiguring the facial features and reducing life expectancy. Now, that's just conjecture on my part, but it does seem to make sense when we look at the story of the bull. So in Greek mythology, the Minotaur is a mythical creature um, that portrays the head of a bull and the body of a man. And the Roman poet Ovid uh, describes it as being part bull and part man. Now it's said that the Minotaur dwelt in the center of the labyrinth, which is an elaborate maze-like construction designed by the architect Daedalus and his son Icarus, and we've heard about Icarus, on the command of King Minos of Crete. So King Minos had this built for his son. And it's said that Minos consulted the oracle and the oracle said that this is where his son should live. So having all of that information, it seems logical to have the, these images of the bull as a way of perhaps mourning, perhaps honoring King Minos' son. Now, it's also clear that the Minoans had a great trading empire with links in Europe and in Africa. The digs reveal huge vats. And we're talking vats of thousands of calories, of, of gallons. And warehouses for storing things like wine and honey and oil and grain. And they even found dungeons built into the ground with large stone walls and solitary confinement cells. Highly developed civilization. And the temple grounds of Kenosis were overwhelming. Today, we might consider the Queen's residence of Buckingham Palace with its 700 rooms as a grand imperial building of the modern age. But, consider this. It is dwarfed by the complex at Kenosis, which has twice as many rooms as Buckingham Palace. Over 1,400 rooms constructed of stone. Over six acres. And this complex, remember, this is as early as 3000 BCE has a complex of running water and even a sewer system. And just think of this. So this is at least 1500 years before the Roman aqueducts. Absolutely astounding how far back this goes and how impressive it is. But the thing that is most profound is the tablets that were found. It had a hieroglyphic type of text that was completely unknown. And there were hundreds of clay tablets with this writing on it. So Evans was right. There was an older civilization and this older civilization had writing. And there appears to be two different languages, both unknown. Uh, the first, Evan's uh, team called the, them Linear A, and the second texts, so the second language, Linear B. But we didn't know anything about these languages, Linear A or Linear B. Now, we know that Kenosis was real. We know that the Minoan civilization existed and was as great as the classical Greeks portray it to be. The Evans team even discovered a huge building of stone with dozens of high, narrow passageways twisting and turning this way and that. So they even found the labyrinth. So, 
two questions remain. Number one, what connection is there between the Minoan civilization and Greek culture? And two, what happened to the Minoans? And these questions had to wait because World War I broke out. Now remember, in, 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 they didn't come back until after World War I, so in around 1922, and Evans is now in his 70s. And Evans' team returns to Gnosis in Crete, but now his focus has changed. He is no longer interested in just revealing its secrets. He now wants to reconstruct it to its former glory. Because he was so rich, and because he paid for its discovery and literally owns the site, there was little to stop him. Now, while this was going on in 1926, um, a great earthquake rocked Crete. And this leads the Evans team to conclude that a similar event may have led to the collapse of Kenosis in around 1400 BCE. Uh, one key evidence was a giant stone staircase that was found in early excavations that had shifted significantly and that excavators had to move to make sense of the site. So that was something that suggested that an earthquake had something to do with this. So this was part of the question of what happened to the Minoans. Their great material building based culture was devastated perhaps in part at least by a great earthquake around 1400 BCE. But that answer was never a good enough answer. Because if you're still alive after an earthquake, you're going to rebuild. And then there was still the question of the mystery of the languages of Linear A and Linear B. So there was lots of questions that remained that plagued Evans. Now, after Evans died, a Greek archaeologist by the name of Spiridon Maritanos in 1932, um, he discovered some sites described by Homer, and so he went on to explore a little bit of... Uh, a coastal villa and in this site uh, he discovered a, a Minoan villa that is now known as the Villa of the Lilies because there was frescoes of lilies beautiful lilies painted on the wall but what something that he discovered at this site was this he discovered great cut blocks that had shifted and it seemed to be that the only thing that could shift blocks as large as this and in the way that it was done was apparently by a tsunami so a giant tidal wave and something else that was found at that 1400 BCE layer was pumice stone which is a very light and porous volcanic rock that's formed by the rich gas and so it's very glassy lava and all of this evidence was being washed up, perhaps, by this giant tidal wave. And this leads Marinatos to look north to an island north of Crete, about 75 miles. And the island was called Santorini. Now, he knew of something that had happened at Santorini that was very significant. At Santorini, a giant volcanic eruption ripped the island in half and clearly caused a tidal wave that had wiped out at least the coastal area of Crete. So let me be clear about how big this eruption was. This eruption on Santorini was not like anything that we see in the modern day. 
uh, on the news. Okay, the explosion from this eruption blew a crater 83 square kilometers out of the island of Santorini. That is massive. 83 square kilometers. And the tidal wave of this eruption must have been unimaginable. And then, a thousand years later, the classical Greek writer Plato writes about a great civilization that was wiped out by a flooding, sunk under the sea, called Atlantis. And Marinato started to see a connection between these two. And so he conjectured that perhaps the Minoan civilization was that of Atlantis. Now, what is clear is that the Minoan civilization was wiped out at least partly by a tidal wave caused by a great volcanic eruption at Santorini. It all even fits the legends of, for example, the lost city of uh, the lost civilization of Atlantis. But the connections just seem too similar to ignore. Plato continually points out to points to the Atlantean society as ruling a whole island, of being a great civilization, and even having influence on the surrounding mainland. And he describes the Atlanteans as having an obsession with the mighty bull. And all of this fits Minoan society perfectly. Now, Marinatos calls Plato's story of, of Atlantis as a distorted memory of the destruction that befell Santorini and Crete, wiping out economic infrastructure of the Minoan civilization. So in 1967, Marinatos is finally able to excavate on Santorini. And almost immediately his team discovers full Minoan communities with the same style and pottery and artwork as on Crete. Completely caked in volcanic ash from 1400 BCE. So the evidence is conclusive. Or it seems to be. The Minoans were wiped out, at least partially, by a volcanic eruption and a subsequent tsunami that wiped out the civilization. On Santorini, the merchant class artwork is perfectly preserved, giving a picture of a common life in Minoan culture. Most importantly, it confirms Marinato's theory. The Minoan's economic infrastructure was wiped out by one giant cataclysmic event. So the outlying communities were covered in ash. Seaports, which were the lifeblood of Kenosis, were destroyed. So Kenosis support structures of trade and crops were lost simultaneously. And therefore, the site had to be abandoned. So it wasn't that the people were wiped out. It's that they had to leave in order to sustain themselves economically and resource-wise. So in the space of a few generations, from around 1400 to 1300 BCE, the civilization collapsed. So that's one question that was answered. Now, remember... There were two forms of written script found in Minoan sites. No one could decipher them. Arthur Evans never deciphered them. But when he retired back to England, he would volunteer speaking to school children about his work. One of those school children was a 14-year-old by the name of Michael Ventris, who loved the question of the unknown languages found at Kenosis. And from that moment on, 
he set about learning all he could about these languages. And at about the age of 30, he finally deciphered the script known as Linear B. It turns out it is Greek. But it's a very difficult, a very archaic form of Greek. Remember, these tablets were at least 500 years before Homer and over a thousand years before Plato. And it turns out Linear B was a primitive, archaic, shorthand form of Greek. Essentially a precursor to the classical Greek language. And Ventris even realized something profound. The names on the Kenos Kenosis tablets were the names common in Greek legends, like Hector, Poseidon, Achilles, and Zeus. By deciphering these texts, he pushed back Greek culture hundreds of years. So this answers the second question. What did the Minoans have to do with Greek culture? Simple. The Minoans were the foundation of Greek culture, at least in part. They represent the oldest known form of what we consider Greek or Western culture. Unfortunately, just as Linear B was being revealed to the world, Michael Ventris died in a car accident in 1954. And this breakthrough we will see later in another lecture is important as uh, Linear B was used by the Mycenaean civilization. Remember Mycenae with uh, Schliemann? We'll talk about that in a later lecture. Unfortunately, the older text, Linear A, the more common of the ancient text from the palace at Kenosis, remains undeciphered. So perhaps... Uh, this is a question that one of you could dedicate your life to answering. Live that question. Uh, reveal something of history to the world. Give us a gift. And I encourage you to think about that. And with that, I will end this lecture on the Minoan civilization. See you next week.